The history of Geb. The mythic pre-Earth fall history of Eastern Garand is largely unknown, with only a few ruins and obscure references in ancient texts providing any clues. These sources suggest that both the serpent folk of the Mwangi interior and the cyclops of the Golgan had scattered outposts along the continent's eastern coast, but no significant cities or fortresses. Today, visitors to the foothills of the Shattered Range can still see a handful of Cyclopean towers, which now stand as empty shells, noteworthy only for their size. Before the Assyrian civilization, the primary culture in eastern Garand are a group archaeologists have taken to calling the Statue Builders, for they left behind no other evidence of their original name. Very little is known about this civilization, as they left few ruins, no written records, and remain a mystery to modern scholars. Archaeological evidence suggests that they were likely humans from either the Mwangi Expanse or the Inner Sea region, and it is believed that they predominantly built structures using wood and animal hides. Their settlements are marked only by a few ditches and earthen hovels. Although their way of life and religious practices are unknown, one notable legacy remains, their statues. The statue builder culture produced hundreds of curiously styled statues crafted from soft marble or soapstone. These figurines typically ranged in size from 8 to 12 inches, though some were considerably larger. They portrayed faceless humanoid forms with sharp, angular styles that was unique to the region. Most of the statues had their arms folded, while some carried weapons or musical instruments. A few of them held their hands in a strange finger-laced gesture that suggested an unusual number of fingers. The first hard date we get for the arrival of more advanced cultures in the region is minus 4987, when the dwarves emerged from the Shattered Range Mountains as they did elsewhere across Garand and Avistan, in the late period of the Age of Darkness. Along the Shattered Range, there emerged two main groups of dwarves. One group, called the Taralu Dwarves, built their capital city deep in the mountain range a place commonly known as the Old Council Hold today, that marks the beginning of their pilgrim path, a cultural journey that takes them from their place of ancestry to their new capital deep in the jungles of the Mwangi Expanse. I discuss the Taralu Dwarves in more detail in my Southern Mwangi video. A second group of dwarves left the security of the mountains to build fortifications along the rugged coastal-facing cliffs on the eastern side of the Shattered Spine. This group would come to be called the Donguni Dwarves, and were named for the sky citadel called Dongun Hold that they established there in minus 4980. I'll discuss this group in more detail in a future video on Alkenstar and the Dongun Hold. According to the well-kept dwarf records of the time, after the arrival of the Donguni Dwarves on the eastern Gurundi coastline, the dwarves struck a bargain with a local human nomad king named Pedraseth, though little is known of the pre-Osirianic culture of which he was a part. Those nomads may have been contemporaries of the statue builders, but were not themselves part of that group. The nomad king offered the arriving dwarves a large territory to call their own, and in exchange, every year they had to deliver a small coffer of silver to King Pathraseth, who, purely of his own free will and initiative, would send a few wagon loads of food and goods to support the new dwarven settlements. This arrangement was well liked by both parties, and for several centuries, the dwarves and the nomads dutifully upheld each of their ends of the bargain. The dwarves of the Dongan Hold were as sophisticated, organized, and well-led as the dwarves of the Five King Mountains, and it is highly likely that if it wasn't for the prescient wisdom of King Pedraseth of the Eastern Gurundi Nomads, that much of these regions would have been colonized by the dwarves, much in the way that the dwarven kings of the Five Kings Mountains colonized the human kingdom of Druma in the Age of Anguish. What ultimately became of the statue builders is a mystery, and dwarf records do not say, as they had little interaction with this culture, preferring instead to deal with the nomads of King Padraseth. Most scholars believe they were conquered by and absorbed into the growing Assyrian Empire during the early Age of Destiny, speaking of which, by the year minus 3000, the Empire of Assyrian was entering into its early expansionist period. As it sought resources to compete with the Tekritanin League and the Jiska Imperium in the West. For more details in the early Osirianic expansions, please see my Osirian deep dive video. The advent of the Empire of Osirian, and more specifically the arrival of ink, papyrus, and the innovation of writing, marked the true beginning of recorded history in Eastern Garand. The Osirians referred to the areas ranging from the Alemian River to the Jaja River as the Southern Reach, which they valued as a critical route into central Garand. 
Through trade at various trading posts, Assyrians' fertile valleys provided bronze and copper metalwork to the southern reach, as well as pottery and furniture, in exchange for skins, ivory, and polished wood. Over time, these trading posts developed into forts, and eventually into towns and cities, as the southern reach of Assyrian grew increasingly prosperous, powerful, and independent-minded. According to surviving records, the pharaohs of Assyrians' first age faced frequent rebellions in the southern reach. Ambitious generals and nomarchs often refused to pay tribute and declared themselves kings, causing trouble for the ruling pharaohs. Although most of these uprisings were easily quashed, a few managed to survive for a considerable time before eventually succumbing to Assyrian's superior military might. Assyrian's first age, however, would come to an end, beginning a period of steep decline for the empire. The last pharaoh of the first age who would reign over a united Assyrian was Jedaret II, who ascended the throne in minus 1611. It is not known when he died, or if he was succeeded by interim pharaohs, but for the southern reaches, the weakness at the heart of the empire was taken as an opportunity to rebel and forge their own destinies. The most successful such rebellion in this period was led roughly in the year minus 1600 by a woman who would come to be known as the Queen of Ebon Feathers. The Queen of Ebon Feathers, then subsequently her daughter and granddaughter, would rule a fairly large empire from minus 1600 to minus 1456, almost 150 years of continuous independent rule. Sometime in the middle of this period, in the year minus 1498, which is generally accepted as the cutoff between the first and second age of Assyrian, the four pharaohs of Ascension rebuilt their empire and reunited most of old Assyrian, but they struggled to bring the new Ebon Feather Empire back into the fold. Using her skilled generalship and some fortunate circumstances, the Queen of Ebon Feathers defeated armies three times the size of hers, starting from the conquest of a small town near modern-day Mechitar to becoming a great regional power within the first few years of her expansion. However, their luck would not hold out forever, and the power of the four pharaohs was the greatest of any in the era. Finally, in minus 1456, the pharaoh Hetshepsu, also known as the Fiend Pharaoh, defeated the Ebon Feather dynasty by marching an impossibly large army into the southern reach. The forces of the Fiend Pharaoh and the recently crowned granddaughter of the original Ebon Feather Queen clashed at the fields of Cherish, resulting in the utter defeat of the young queen and the reabsorption of their land by the Empire of Assyrian. While the pharaohs of the Second Age did their best to erase the evidence of the Ebon Feather Empire from history, a few steely survived the purge. One of them, now on display in Absalom, reads that the first ebon feather queen had come to her people garbed in the light of the dying sun and claiming to be the daughter of death itself. Despite the fall of the queen of ebon feathers, the four pharaohs period was good for the southern reach in general, which experienced a period of growth and development. Trade picked up, and goods flowed once more over the mountains from the Mwangi expanse, as both the Taralu and the Donguni dwarves were able to develop friendly relationships with the pharaonic rulers of Assyrian and the various governors of their vassal cities. New roads and irrigation systems were constructed across the badlands, facilitating further growth of towns into cities. It was during this time that the city of Quantium emerged as a significant seaport on the eastern coast of Garand. The city received ships from distant lands such as Vudra, Iblidos, and Tianxia, further enhancing its importance as a center of trade and commerce. The glorious Four Pharaohs period came to an end in minus 1431, however, with all four pharaohs succumbing to the same mysterious malady. Without their power at the head of the empire, almost immediately Osirian slid back into decline. In this period of decline, in minus 1140 specifically, a male child of unknown first name was born to the august noble family of Geb in Osirian's capital city of Sothis. As a lesser son of one of Sothis's great noble houses, the young Geb's appointed role in life was to become a mortuary priest, likely going into training as a cleric of one of Osirian's many funerary deities, such as Isis or Anubis. It is known that the young Geb dabbled in magics, both divine and arcane, perhaps in the hopes that he might better support his family's ambitions to the throne, and he was proficient as a wizard as well as as a mortuary priest. By the time Prince Geb was a teenager, as was happening frequently in the time following the end of the Four Pharaohs period, a power struggle occurred for rulership of Osirian and ascension to the much vaunted position of Pharaoh. Naturally, the young prince supported his own family, the Gebs, but the gods had other plans. The power struggle was won by a man named Kenaton the Pious. 
Pharaoh Kenaton would prove cunning and wise, equally skilled in war and administration. Kenaton's brilliant rulership brought a halt to Assyrian slow decline. In a lightning series of military campaigns, he reunited the disjointed Assyrian lands. In the process, he put many warlords and renegade mages to flight to the furthest edges of the empire. Although he was reputed to be a brilliant man and a great leader, Pharaoh Kenaton brooked no slight to his rule, and those families that opposed him during his battle for ascension found themselves exiled or killed for their lack of loyalty. This is what happened to the young prince of the Geb family. The rest of his family was brutally entombed alive by Pharaoh Kenaton and his regime in minus 1119, and to avoid the same fate, he, the sole survivor of the House of Geb, fled to the furthest reaches of the empire. From that point on, his given name was lost to time, becoming known simply as Geb, the grand necromancer Geb, and ultimately the ghost king. Traveling from Sothis to the southernmost reaches of what the Assyrians considered the civilized world, Geb arrived in the port town of Mechitar, the old home of the Queen of Ebon Feathers. It is reported that he laid low for a while there, returning to his arcane studies. But his brush with the brutality of the pharaoh Kenaton had hardened his heart. According to some sources, in the year minus 1108, Geb approached the palace of the provincial governor and politely asked to be made king. When the provincial governor laughed at the young upstart, Geb tore his soul from his body. In short order, Geb was crowned king of a new country, which he named after himself and his lost house. The pharaoh Kenaton lived just long enough to see Geb's emergence as a regional power before his own death. After Kenaton's death only a few years after Geb established his kingdom, Osirian slipped back into decline, and Geb had no trouble securing his realm. In order to ensure that future pharaohs would never be able to take his land from him, Geb turned to necromancy, only in small pockets at first, ensuring that his smaller armies of living soldiers would be supported by skilled necromancers, and therefore ample soldiers in the form of the risen dead. In the year minus 1070, another child with an aptitude for arcane magic was born in the region. A boy named Nex was born in the port city of Quantium. Unlike Geb, Nex was not of noble descent, but rather an orphan who learned his first spells from the weather wizards and sea mages there. Possessing an uncanny connection to the great beyond, Nex became a wanderer and adventurer, driven by the promise of power, glory, and immortality that he saw in his visions. The specifics of his travels during those years are uncertain, but it is known that Nex journeyed multiple times to the Mwangi Expanse and discovered a wealth of occult knowledge there. Persistent rumors suggest that he even visited the lost city of Erd and acquired secret and long-forgotten lore there. When Nex was in his 87th year, yet still looking like a man in his early middle years, thanks to powerful life-extending magics, Nex returned from his last great adventure to his native city of Quantium. Nex returned at the head of an army of grotesque creatures, which he had summoned from the depths of the dark tapestry in the great beyond. The city of Quantium surrendered with little resistance, and Nex became known as the Archmage and the Wizard King, taking control of the northern portion of the former southern reach of Osirian. The precise cause of the conflict between Grand Necromancer Geb and the Master Archmage Nex remains shrouded in mystery, likely known only to the two of them, and they have ever chosen to keep silent on the matter. Nevertheless, it is widely accepted that the rivalry between the two great wizards escalated into a spectacular falling out. Initially, the two wizard-ruled realms appeared to coexist peacefully, engaging in trade and diplomacy like any neighboring countries. At that time, Geb's land was predominantly inhabited by the living, with the dead only seen in the necromancer's armies or performing menial tasks. Geb and Nex, who were the only two archmages of the time and the most powerful wizards of their age, initially visited each other cordially with no hint of animosity. However, the two wizards' friendly competition for superiority in their craft quickly turned into an increasingly bitter feud, as neither could bear to be second best. The mages began to argue, and then battle. While historians generally agree that the brash and aggressive Nex made the first move against his more composed rival, Nex's followers have long claimed it was in response to some covert Gebite plot. Regardless of who struck first, the conflict between the two nations lasted for over a millennium. The geb nex War, also known as the Mage War, or the Thousand Year War, was a devastating conflict that remains one of the most destructive in Galarian's histories. 
It kicked off in minus 892, with Nexian forces attempting to annex some strategic lands across the Spellscar coastline towards the city of Ilead, and thereafter it almost never relented. The two Archmages, each possessing immense power and an equal amount of spite, engaged in countless battles over the course of a millennium. It would be a futile exercise to attempt to outline the vast number of battles, skirmishes, and assaults in the course of this period, but I will attempt to highlight some of the most devastating encounters. About a hundred years into the war, Geb tried to win by blotting out the sun, presuming his undead forces would have the advantage in the darkness. In response, Nex created a baleful fire that consumed every strand of shadow and destroyed Geb's spell. In minus 585, Nex concocted the Reign of Venomous Teeth ritual. He killed an ancient dragon and used its fangs to create an elixir which he poured over the land with a mighty wind. Each droplet of the elixir transformed into a venomous serpent that wreaked havoc across Geb's kingdom. To counter this attack, Geb summoned a clammy grey mist from deep underground and commanded his undead servants to kill every sluggish serpent they could find. Although the geb next war was a destructive conflict, a thousand years of war is a long time, and there were also periods of relative peace. The war was punctuated by numerous ceasefires and truces, which were often disrupted by short but brutal conflicts. The two archmages were evenly matched, so they spent many years searching for new tactics that might give them an advantage. In minus 147, for example, Geb stumbled upon an ancient leviathan hidden in the abyssal depths of the sea, which he resurrected to serve him. From the creature's bones, he fashioned a monstrosity as large as a cathedral that walked on its ribs and attacked its enemies with three fluke-tipped tails. Geb commanded the horror to move towards Quantium under the water, waiting for the opportune moment to strike in Nex's absence. When the timing was right, the city was barely able to repel the assault, but a quick-witted apprentice mage noticed the controlling diadem lodged inside the leviathan's skeletal brain and sacrificed her life to dislodge it. Legend has it that the uncontrolled beast retreated to the ocean, where it still lurks off the coast of Nex. Following this attack, the Archmage created the Quantium Golems, a matched pair of titans, to protect the city in his absence. Another example of this occurred in the year 166, when Nex traveled north to Absalom and built a powerful magical spire there as the first step in a more elaborate attempt to conquer the city and claim the Starstone. According to popular legend, Nex came close to achieving his objective, but ultimately turned back because he was unwilling to pay the price of ascending to godhood. In actual fact, the true reason behind the end of the Siege of Absalom remains unconfirmed. The Thousand Year War persisted, and as time wore on, the once prosperous region between the rival mage kingdoms deteriorated into a desolate and abandoned wasteland. The former inhabitants of Assyrian fled. The dwarves of Dongan Hold sealed off their tunnels and withdrew underground to wait for the conflict to end, and the Talaru dwarves of the Shattered Spine abandoned the region altogether to settle in the Mwangi Expanse. Over time, the borderlands between the two nations became known as the Mana Wastes, a place plagued by centuries of magical pollution, alchemical contamination, restless undead, and dimensional ruptures. The mana wastes held no value to anyone and stood as ravaged, arcane testaments to the power of its creators and their never-ending, unchanging animosity. The Thousand Year War came to an unexpected end in the year 576. Nex's great retaliation to Gebite aggression that year was to unleash a series of natural disasters across Geb's kingdom. These attacks were not aimed directly at Geb, but instead at the entire country, causing tens of thousands of people to die. Driven by grief and anger, Geb unleashed a poison fog on his own nation. Up until that point, Geb had always ruled over a kingdom of the living, supported by undead soldiers, but no longer. With this act, Geb transformed his entire nation into an army of the undead, and then, bringing to bear the full might of his country, he invaded Nex and laid siege to Quantium. There, at the gates of Quantium itself, he summoned the same murderous fog, and he sent it into Bandishar, the Archmage Nex's grand palace in Quantium. Everyone inside was killed, but the Archmage himself was nowhere to be found. Nex's fate remains unknown. Some speculate that he escaped to his own private demiplane called the Refuge of Nex, while others believe he died unnoticed. Geb, uncertain of his rival's fate, became paranoid and obsessed with finding him. The Archlords of Nex, Nex's ruling council of mages, took over rulership of the country after the Archmage's disappearance, and they didn't or couldn't provide Geb with any information about their master's whereabouts. 
Eventually, Geb's own paranoia and depression got the better of him. He did, after all, kill everyone in his own country in order to quote-unquote win the war. In his anguish, he committed ritual suicide, but that was not to stick. He remained tethered to the material world as a ghost, bound forever to the land by his own obsession. For the next few thousand years, Geb and Nex settled into a new kind of normal. Nex's Ark Lords developed a joint system of governance between them, while the sentient undead who lived in Geb's realm of the living dead began to compete for leadership over various cities and factions as the ghost of Geb, though still powerful and nominally in charge, continued to grow increasingly withdrawn. As I have recounted elsewhere, but perhaps in greatest detail in my Ustalav deep dive video, in 3827 a significant event occurred in central Avastan, where an Aradonite paladin named Diomede managed to defeat the great lich Tar Bafon, also known as the Whispering Tyrant, who had ruled over an undead nation in that region for almost 300 years. They sealed Tar Bafon deep in the Hungry Mountains with a magical seal. Then, five years later, in 3832, Iomede traveled to Absalom and passed the test of the Starstone, acquiring a spark of divinity and ascending to the heavens. There, as a young demigoddess, she offered her service to her sworn deity Aridon, the patron god of humanity, and became Aridon's herald and foremost servant, replacing Aridon's former herald, the fallen demigoddess Arasni, whom Aridon had sent to the material world to assist in the fight against Tar Bafon, but who had been killed on the material plane, her dismembered body entombed in a great castle in the last wall capital city of Vigil. Iomede's ascension swelled the hearts of the Knights of Lastwall, still riding high on both their success against the Whispering Tyrant and on the knowledge that one of their own had ascended to the heavens as a goddess, they turned their attentions to other parts of the world where the undead thrived. There was no more obvious target than the domain of the ghost king Geb, whom they perceived to be the Gurundi equivalent of the Whispering Tyrant. The Watcher Lord of Lastwall, the highest-ranking member of the Knights of Lastwall, began planning a crusade into the southern nation, enlisting the aid of Talden allies to assemble a great fleet in Opara and sail south to lay siege to the Gebite capital of Mechitar. In 3850 they set sail, but they underestimated their enemy. The ghost king Geb annihilated their ships and shattered their forces among the rocks. Those few that survived were killed by his servants and soon rose to join the loyal ranks of the living dead. Though Lastwall would abandon their efforts to confront the Ghost King or his kingdom, once roused from his torpor, the Ghost King's infamous ire was not so easily set aside. The Ghost King plotted an adventure of his own. Selecting from among the dead knights of Lastwall's most heroic knights, he turned them to dark purpose, and in 3890 he sent them back into their own country to steal the corpse of Erasne, the former herald of Aradon. Typically, when a post-mortal form, like that of an angel, devil, or god, is destroyed, their composite quintessence is reabsorbed by the outer plane in which they dwell, and they reach a state of final rest or ended existence. However, that situation is complicated when a post-mortal form is killed on the material plane, and their quintessence is not so easily released. When the Islanti goddess Akavna died on Galarian during the Earthfall Cataclysm, for example, her blood gave rise to the Mordant Spire, and a measure of her power still lives in that structure, and in the Mordant Spire elves who live there. It would seem foolish to imagine that a gifted necromancer like Geb couldn't find some use for the magic and quintessence still found in Arasni's severed corpse. It is reported that it took Geb over a year to piece back together what was left of Arasni's soul, with quintessence siphoned back from the great beyond. He had her corpse carefully stitched back together as he did this, and then he began to exert his subtle yet potent influence on her, honing in on her doubt and resentment until he had transformed her into a lich devoid of her former self. He turned her against her once allies, especially Iomede, who he informed her had stolen her position at Aradin's side. Geb then elevated her to the position of his lich queen, and tasked her with administration duties which he deemed too menial for himself. When the Knights of Lastwall realized Geb's treachery, they sent a retaliatory force to recover Erasny's corpse. They arrived in 3891, only to be met by an army of the dead, led by the revivified Erasny. Erasny swiftly defeated this second incursion, and as Geb returned to his despair and isolation, in time she would come to rule Geb in its entirety, as the Lich Queen. 
In 4329, an exiled pirate queen named Mastrian Slash from the southern nation of Holomog conquered the land south of Geb. Feeling confident after her victory over the Noel tribes that had previously laid claim to that land, she decided to invade Geb, but that turned out to be a fatal mistake. The Ghost King proved he could still be roused to action when needed, and he cast a spell that turned Mastrian's entire army to stone, creating what is now known as the Field of Maidens, marking the southern border of the barren land. In 4588, a young engineer from Nex named Ansel Alkenstar fled from an arrest warrant by escaping into the mana wastes. There he discovered a community of refugees and outcasts residing in the ruins of Donganhold. How Ansel rallied this disparate group, led them deeper into the ruins, met the dwarves, and convinced them to return are the stuff of legend. Regardless of the details, Ansel managed to convince the dwarves to return to Donganhold, and they brought with them a game-changing invention, firearms. With the restoration of Donganhold and the founding of the Duchy of Alkenstar, a new polity emerged, theoretically owing allegiance to Nex, but in practice forming a new independent city-state between the larger kingdoms of Geb and Nex, surrounded by the mana wastes. In 4606, Aradin died. Iomade took the mantle of the Inheritor, effectively succeeding him as a god of nobility and law, inheriting a great number of his worshippers. The Lich Queen Arasni observed all of this with quiet resentment, but the almost thousand years since her resurrection had started to change her as well, and she was beginning to see things a little more clearly. In the year 4716, suddenly, and without explanation, the gates of the refuge of Nex, which had been closed for thousands of years, opened again. This sparked widespread speculation that the Archmage Nex had indeed survived the fall of Quantium many years ago, and was now planning to return to his homeland. But it has been seven years, and Nex himself has yet to re-emerge from the demiplane. Not long after the gates opened, however, the Flesh Forges rumbled once more to life. The Flesh Forges were building-sized artifacts created by the Archmage Nex during the war. They created monsters ranging from humble house golems to gigantic creatures which rivaled the largest dragons in power. Mighty beasts and monsters, more powerful than anything the Ark Lords had summoned in over a thousand years, marched south into the mana wastes, but they have yet to cross the threshold into Geb's domain. That hasn't stopped many in the region from believing that they have been activated in anticipation of Nex's inevitable return. In 4719, the events of the Tyrant's Grasp adventure path take place. The Whispering Tyrant finally breaks free of his containment in Gallowspire. He destroys the nation of Lastwall and turns it into a land of the living dead called the Gravelands. In the course of these events, the Lich Queen Arasni feels the stirrings of vengeance against the tyrant that broke her and tore her apart all those long millennia ago, and she helps a group of adventurers to thwart the Whispering Tyrant's plans to conquer the entire region, forcing him to retreat and recover in the ancient and terrible Isle of Terror, which now serves as a seat of power. In the course of these events, Arasni has abdicated the throne of Geb and abandoned the service of the Ghost King. Between Arasni's abdication and the threat of Nex's old war engines reactivating, the Ghost King has had no choice but to take renewed interest in his own kingdom, and as rumours of Nex's return grow, Geb has worked hard to put his land back on a war footing. It is in this context in 4722 that the events of the second edition Bloodlord's Adventure Path unfolds. Here is the tagline. The ghost king Geb rules a nation where the living and undead work uneasily side by side. The power behind the throne and the true rulers of Geb are the Blood Lords, a scheming group of undying necromancers whose whims affect millions. Joining the Blood Lords isn't easy, but your band of less than good-hearted troubleshooters is destined to ascend their ranks for exposing a dangerous plot to the nation. The danger only increases once your characters become bloodlords, as the intrigues of the undead rulers are fiercest against each other. Powerful factions and ancient secrets are all playthings in the deadly trickery. Your bloodlords must fight from the borders of the nation to the sepulchral halls of power to claim their authority over the land of the dead. The Bloodlords AP is the most recent event in the region, which of course brings us to Geb Today. During Arasni's reign as the Lich Queen, the Ghost King had become increasingly reclusive, and sightings of him venturing beyond his palace were rare indeed. Many believed it was best to ignore him, and hoped in time he would just wither away. In this period of relative peace, the nation of Geb was beginning to be recognized as a political power on the world stage. 
despite the fact that many nations were hesitant to treat with an undead nation. However, everything changed when Nexus' great engines of war, the Flesh Forges, activated on their own, and mighty beasts and monsters marched south into the mana wastes. For the Ghost King, this was a long-awaited day, and he began assembling his forces to prepare for war. After 4,000 years of relative quiet, the Ghost King faces unprecedented challenges. He realizes his prolonged seclusion had left him unaware of Arasni's growing independence, and he did not anticipate her disappearance with the rise of Tarbafon in the north. With Arasni gone, Geb is compelled to assume the role of a true leader once more. However, much has changed in the last four millennia, and Geb's ghostly form is magically bound to the soil of the city of Mechitar, so he must rely on his conniving bloodlords for his war council and for leading actions abroad, each of whom has been vying for his attention since Arasni's departure. Overcoming these obstacles is crucial for the Ghost King to be ready for the Archmage Nexus' anticipated return. The Ghost King has already started to look beyond the Bloodlords, in fact, and has appointed a new circle of Grave Knights, dubbed his War Master Council, to prepare his nation for the resumption of war. As part of this rebuilding effort, the Ghost King is currently conducting a comprehensive assessment of his nation, and he has discovered that no fewer than three cities, one of which housed the most prominent school of necromancy in all of Geb, have disappeared without a trace. The king's most perceptive bloodlords have surmised that these cities were absorbed into the Hao Jin Tapestry, an artifact created centuries ago by the recently resurrected Tian sorceress Hao Jin, providing access to a demiplane where entire cities have been secreted away. In an attempt to recover the necropolis, Geb has dispatched a delegation of envoys to distant Goka in Tianxia to negotiate its return, or failing that, demanding reparations from Hao Jin herself for the loss. During the first war with Nex, the dwarven sky citadel of Donganhold held little importance to him, but now the Ghost King is compelled to pay attention to the kingdom and the prosperous city-state flourishing nearby. An alliance with High King Anong Aranek, fortified by the firearms of Alkenstar and the technological knowledge of Donganhold, is something that Geb regards as crucial to his interests. Even if the dwarves proved to be of minimal value, removing one of Nex's supposed allies would certainly serve as an entertaining prelude to the impending war. Another emerging aspect of international relations involves a potential partnership with Camellia Dranek from Galt. The agreement entails Camellia sharing valuable intelligence regarding Nex and its spire, while the Ghost King contributes his expertise in necromancy to help free the souls of Galton citizens trapped in the Final Blades, a type of magical guillotine used in Galt during the Revolution. This exchange is mutually beneficial, as the released souls can either live within Geb or move on from the Material Plane. The Ghost King finds the information on his obsession quite enticing, but given his unpredictable nature, the success of this alliance remains uncertain. Moreover, some reports suggest that the Ghost King might have the ultimate goal of transforming these soul-laden blades into terrible weapons for his Grave Knights. Finally, the Ghost King, in a desperate attempt to break free from the power that keeps him trapped in Mechitar, has issued an invitation to all kinds of occultists, necromancers, clerics of death, and mediums to come to the capital. His aim is to find someone who can solve the mystery of his curse. Despite his expertise in necromancy, he has been unable to reconcile with his own nature as a ghost, which is the primary reason for his bound condition. Memories of his suicide and revival remain scars on his mind, which he still struggles to piece together. To anyone who can help him, the Ghost King has offered generous rewards. With a new war between Geb and Nex looming, Many, possibly most, are trying to prevent it from happening altogether. This includes ambitious vampire and lich bloodlords of Geb, who do not wish to be pawns in the Ghost King's War, and even Nexian Arclords who will lose their status and power if the Archmage Nex ever returns, as well as innocent bystanders who do not wish to be caught in the middle. Adventurers, pathfinders, and mercenaries from all over Galarian have been secretly hired to find a way to maintain the peace. Both countries have their pro-war factions as well, of course. Whether the more violent or corrupted Bloodlords and Geb, or the Arclords of Nex who view peace with the dead as a blasphemous affront. And of course, it all might not matter. If the Archmage Nex and the Ghost King will it, all the opposition in the world might not be enough to stop them. 
But then again, the two countries are bigger than they once were, wealthier and wiser and more sophisticated, and even the two great wizard kings of old might not command the absolute loyalty they once did. Class and Social Hierarchy in Geb For those unfamiliar with Geb, the society is comprised of three main groups, the dead, the quick, and the thralls. The dead is the preferred term for all intelligent types of undead. The quick is a catch-all term for the living residents of the land, and the thralls refers to both living slaves and mindless undead laborers. After the decimation of Geb's quick population, the dead laws were established. To safeguard the largely undead population from being targeted by divine spellcasters with an anti-undead agenda, and also to protect the living from being randomly attacked by the undead. They also regulate various aspects of necromancy, and strictly forbid the use of positive energy within the borders of Geb. Although some individuals believe that they are exempt from these laws, visitors to the nation are advised to exercise caution. In Geb, the dead laws are regarded as absolute. The fusion of living and undead populations in Geb is reflected in the aesthetics and national sense of style. While architecture and decor are dominated by death motifs, such as building facades adorned with enormous skulls and black tapestries that resemble hanging funeral shrouds, personal fashion tends to emulate that of the living, often in exaggerated ways. Undead fashionistas can be seen donning living flowers, brightly colored fabric, or even using illusion magic to give the appearance of life. To mask the scent of decay, many wear strong perfumes and complement each other on their vibrant appearances. A further stratification within the social hierarchy exists among both the quick and the dead. The abundant farmland of Geb is tended by countless skeletons and zombies or living thralls, who form the lowest rung of the country's social hierarchy. Despite producing tons of food each year, the largely undead population do not need it, opting instead to trade it for imported finished goods favored by the country's highest tiers of society. Geb's laws permit anyone who dies within its borders, whether citizen or foreigner, to be raised as an undead laborer, ensuring a constant supply of replacement workers when undead laborers are worn down from overwork to the point of uselessness. In Geb cities, after centuries of neglect, the ghost king's return to active rulership has initiated a kind of national renaissance. Both living artisans and unliving administrators work tirelessly to complete the next great work in honor of the ghostly king. A strata above the artisans and administrators, various kinds of intelligent undead, including morgues, bodaks, and devourers, serve as the city's enforcer class, enforcing laws, settling rivalries, and solidifying the strangleholds on power put in place by the next tier of society. This next tier is commonly called the Lesser Nobility, generally comprised of undead beings such as whites, ghouls, and shadows. While they put on airs and graces, they have no true power beyond their ability to create intelligent progeny and are mocked in private by the kingdom's highest tier, the Blood Lords. The Blood Lords are the most elite tier of society, consisting of powerful aristocrats such as vampires, liches, mummies, and even some living necromancers. The vampire Kemnebi has been the chief blood lord since the group's inception, and holds the chancellor's office, making him second only to the ghost king himself in power. At court, these blood lords sing praises to their nation and their king, but all the while they subtly conceal their many schemes as they have grown wealthy and powerful on the rich trade brought about by the long peace, and few among them have any great desire to return to the ancient war that the ghost king covets. The ruling undead class possess immortality, stamina, and stubbornness. They are firmly established and capable of playing the waiting game, formulating political strategies that can endure for centuries, as complex and intricate as any in Galarian. Certain plans can become extremely ambitious, delving deeply into the politics of the inner sea and beyond, extending much further than most are aware of. Factions in Geb in addition to the various stratas of society to be found in Geb, the nation is also influenced by a great many factions. The Builders' League. The oldest and most conservative of the great factions in Geb is the Builders' League, which is responsible for the city's infrastructure, architecture, and public works. Members of the League are constantly engaged in new projects and renovations, having constructed most of the city's roads, aqueducts, courthouses, temples, and other important buildings. 
The Builders' League is handsomely compensated for their work on engineering projects that can take centuries to complete and must last for millennia, given the country's largely undead population that does not age. However, their true wealth lies in their knowledge of the occult. Certain projects include secret passages leading to libraries, reliquaries, or ritual chambers known only to League members. Nothing is more valuable to the Builders' League than exclusive knowledge. The Celebrants the celebrants, the most recently formed of the great factions, are the most visibly ascendant. Flaunting their penchant for attention-seeking, they have enthusiastically welcomed the Ghost King's reappearance and his reign over the nation. Serving as Geb's public relations experts, they have mastered the arts of propaganda and misinformation. They organize parades, festivals, and national holidays to celebrate Geb's victories, both authentic and fictitious, in order to bolster nationalistic pride. The celebrants maintain a close relationship with the Church of Ergothoa, whose extravagant and repugnant feasts are always a cause for celebration, and many of their members also evangelize for the pallid princess. The Church of Ergothoa. Not officially counted among the great factions, the various temples of Ergothoa are nonetheless very influential in the nation. It is the ubiquitous faith of the undead nation, and Geb is one of the few places on Galarian where one may openly worship the pallid princess. Interestingly, the living residents of Geb also hold a fascination for Ergothoa, especially in her guise as a goddess of hedonism. Some of them embrace her creed, choosing to enjoy their fleeting lives to the fullest. Others think of her as an insurance policy, believing that worshipping her will lead them to rewards of a higher form of undeath beyond that of a simple skeleton or zombie after their inevitable demise, a matter which is often out of their hands. However, the influence of this religious faction is not absolute, and in fact there has always been a certain tension between the hungry passions of the pallid princess and the more clinical ambitions of the blood lords. As a result, while most of the free-willed undead in Geb pay homage to Ergothoa, those at the highest levels of society tend to only pay lip service to the goddess, and some even prefer to worship more erudite deities of magic and sorcery, such as Nethys or even Baphomet on occasion. The Export Guild. All of Geb's foreign trade is managed by the Export Guild, which handles not only the exportation of crops, lore, and military goods, but also the importation of various goods. The Export Guild's strict control over trade has made it a highly influential and wealthy organization. While members of the Guild are typically strong nationalists who prioritize Geb's interests, they are also pragmatic individuals who do not allow tradition or ceremony to impede their business dealings. When negotiating with other nations, the Export Guild tends to prioritize members who can quickly adapt to the situation, as they understand that negotiating with a ghoul or wraith can be unsettling for foreign trade representatives. The Reanimators The Reanimators, despite their limited focus on raising the dead for agricultural work, wield a significant influence over Gebite society. They are responsible for the proper disposal of the dead and supply labor for many of the nation's farms and ranches. In addition, they maintain strong ties with influential necromantic academies throughout the land. Although not necessarily skilled necromancers themselves, members of this faction excel at organization and management. They often joke that while one may only be raised as undead once, working for the reanimators ensures employment for eternity. The Tax Collectors Union The Tax Collectors Union is also one of the great factions in Geb. It is composed of prominent aristocrats and bankers who hold the responsibility for the nation's finance and investment interests. These leaders have been accumulating wealth for thousands of years and have amassed enormous funds that can be used to buy their way out of or into any situation. The faction is known for its staunch traditionalism and resistance to change. Despite this, the Ghost King allows their hoarding because they work tirelessly to maintain the nation's stability and keep its financial systems running. The Quick Dead Coalition. A movement has emerged among the younger necromancers and newly reanimated undead to update the dead laws. Known as the Quick Dead Coalition, this group aims to modernize the Codex by removing morally questionable and outdated sections. They seek to establish stronger regulations on the creation of mindless undead and improve the working conditions of quick laborers. The Coalition proposes a program for corpse donation after death, arguing that living individuals who enter into temporary service contracts with the undead should have the option to consent to the program. Otherwise, their remains must be put to rest as per their wishes. 
The Quick Dead Coalition also demands stronger regulations on contracts created between the living and undead to prevent exploitation. Although the coalition's demands were initially considered a joke, the increasing number of supporters in Mechatar and surrounding areas has caused some of the Bloodlords to reconsider their value, even if only as political pawns. However, of all their proposals, the allowance of positive energy casting has been met with the most violent opposition from the ruling class. Even those among the undead who sympathize with the coalition suggest a higher import of alchemical healing agents over risking their own safety. Important locations in Geb. Let's take a closer look at the lands of Geb. We'll start with the capital city of Mechatar and the commercial and military center of Iled in the north of the country. Then we'll move from north to south, touching on some other key locations along the way. Mechatar. As one approaches the coast of Geb, the city of Mechatar appears like a grand festival, with enormous flags waving in the sea breeze. The banners and curtains hang from the highest points of the city, running from building to building and blocking out the sun. Ships dock in awesome harbor, bringing in all sorts of people, from necromancers and devotees of Urgothoa to diplomats, traders, and the dangerously curious. On the crowded docks, sailors gather ghoulish cargo while their captains negotiate passage for both the living and the dead. The towering gate, called Admonition, allows caravans to enter the city from the north. To truly know Mechatar, one must walk its streets. Mindless corpses dressed in ancient heraldry march down boulevards while carrying grotesque horrors on palanquins. Acolytes of Ergothoa drag captives and heretics in long processions, leaving trails of gore in their wake as they chant liturgies to the goddess of undeath. The city guard, known as the Bellator Mortis, parade around the Cinerarium, and in pyramids filled with wealth and magic, powerful undead beings plot against each other. A foul river surrounds the towering black pyramid at the center of Mechatar, its fumes nauseatingly thick. In the cramped region of the city, buildings jostle for space while the streets remain dimly lit. Living animals march in chains to the meat markets, while parades of corpses are raised and sold off to the school of necromancy. Both the living and the dead bid for flesh and bone, which are then given an unholy resurrection. Skeletons and zombies drag wagons of produce grown alongside the cattle. The noble dead and their favored live in luxury in the upper reaches of the city, surrounded by horror. But beneath the grand displays of undead power, the very soil of Mechatar holds the city's true history. It is the same soil that Geb touched 5,000 years ago when he made the city his home, and the same that drank his blood when he died by ritual suicide. They say that Geb broods in the Cinerarium, but the undead walk on the very soil that is Geb's true home. Mechatar stands on unholy ground, desecrated by Geb's own blood. The city's will is as strong as its ruler's determination, to outlast all of creation if necessary. Mechatar is the capital city of the Ghost King, the centerpiece of his power and the heart of his strength. Much like the rest of Geb, Mechatar divides its citizens into two groups, the quick and the dead. The dead, who are immortal and unchanging, constitute the majority of the city's population. Unlike the rest of the country, though, Mechatar is both a thriving port city and the capital, giving it a much larger population share of quick residents, imported living thralls, and quick visitors, traders, and merchants, which the city does its level best to welcome and make feel safe. The living inhabitants of Mechatar are still mostly of Osiriani Garundi ethnicity, with a propensity for being tall, slender, and fine-boned. Men often shave their heads, eyebrows, and faces, giving them a lean and sharp appearance. Alternatively, some men wear their hair long, but style it in simple braids or a wide twist at the nape of the neck, with the hair flat on top to accommodate different head coverings. Loose, pastel-colored robes with long sleeves and loose trousers are the norm for men's clothing, with longer vests featuring embroidery in intricate designs growing in popularity. Women's clothing usually covers their torsos and legs while leaving their arms bare, with pleated cotton garments wrapped around the body or fastened at the back. Colorful shawls or scarves are common accessories for women, with various shades of crimson being a popular choice. Leather sandals are the preferred footwear for all citizens, with the exception of equestrians who wear short-heeled ankle shoes. 
Both men and women use coal to darken their eye sockets, and on special occasions, white paint is applied to highlight facial features and accentuate the form of a person's skull. Jewelry is kept to a minimum, with gemmed rings, jeweled amulets, and golden bracelets being the most common accessories. Palanquins are the preferred mode of transportation for those who can afford to hire a team, while the wealthy and powerful use magically enhanced litters that block out sunlight for safety or comfort. Mechitar's architecture owes a great deal to its northern predecessor, Osirian, whose pyramids and obelisks dominate the city's skyline. Mechitar's buildings feature stripped-down reliefs and pictographic elements, with some structures covered in rare metals or stone and embellished with bands of gold and crimson banners to proclaim their allegiance or accomplishments. Before Arasni's departure, her favorite bloodlord split Mechitar into small fiefdoms, leaving Queen Arasni herself to govern the most important matters from the Cinerarium. Since her departure, though, her loyalists have either fled the city or been killed, and now the Blood Lords are quickly vying for power, and the Ghost King is happy to allow his subordinates to fight among themselves to eliminate the weak. As a result, the city has been left to be managed by its administrators, and those few Blood Lords who chose not to be involved in the political maneuvering. Two such Blood Lords are Gehera, a vampire of unknown origin, and Agathe, a lich originally from Taldor. They have ensured a smooth transition without demanding recognition, but their apparent selflessness is viewed with suspicion and scrutiny by others. Mechitar's trade policy is fairly simple, with tariffs and taxes collected by the harbour master Varnetta Zenofa, who also ensures the safe arrival and departure of ships and protects the city from naval attacks. Varnetta is knowledgeable in naval warfare and actively engages in battle abroad on her personal dreadnought, which is always ready to set sail at a moment's notice. Her crew of skeletons tirelessly row in pursuit of pirates and ships attempting to blockade the harbour. Witnesses to her violent ship-to-ship -ship combat speak of her incredible acts of violence as she single-handedly clears enemy decks of soldiers, satisfying her bloodlust in the carnage. In Mechitar, where both the government and church are controlled by undead leaders, it is crucial to present a living member of the ruling council to the traders and visitors who maintain the city's commerce. To fulfill this role, Guard Captain Marden Gilfer, a living human knight with loose morals, but a hard stance on enforcing the dead laws, was appointed to lead the Bellator Mortis. The city guard, which is in fact composed primarily of undead soldiers and some few quick guard who were unswervingly loyal to Marden. Technically subservient to Bloodlord Torben, guard captain Marden finds himself with a free hand these days as Torben competes with other high-ranking members to sit at the Ghost King's right hand. Courts and Mechitar operate under arbitrary interpretations of the law, resulting in inconsistent sentencing. Dozens of courthouses are scattered throughout the city, each under the control of various blood lords, and selecting the appropriate judge is crucial to obtaining favorable rulings. The severity of punishments can be intense, and here execution is considered to be an easy way out, allowing the soul to escape while leaving the body to be used. Curses are commonly considered the most vicious option available to judges, which can have lasting impact to the immortal undead for millennia. Mechitar is enclosed by ancient walls that stretch in a sinuous line punctuated by regular battlements. Inside the city, there are additional walls that divide subdistricts and block access to the harbour. Apart from a sprawling shanty town between the northeastern walls and the Axenir River, there are no settlements outside the walls. Over the centuries, the walls themselves have expanded to contain everything within Mechitar. Two massive gatehouses, admonition and service, once stood in the northern and southern walls, but only the battlements remain, since no army has threatened the city by land for generations. The main district of Mechitar lies within the western part of the city, and it contains important locations such as the Cinerarium, the Cathedral of Epiphenomena, the Bloodlord's Palaces, the Eben Mausoleum, and the Grand Cirque Bazaar as well as the meat markets, all under the protection of the Bellator Mortis. The awesome harbour is a separate district, containing many warehouses and also the Deathless Arena. It is located far enough from the River of Rot to make life tolerable for most of the quick citizens who can afford a dwelling along the ocean front. Finally, north of the River of Rot is the Vassal Alley, a crowded and impoverished city within a city, enclosed by walls to keep its destitute and miserable citizens in one place. 
The Cinerarium is the tallest pyramid in Mechatar, towering over the city and crowned with a 20-foot solid gold cap held by mithril bands. The structure hums with necromantic energy, fueled by the tombs, chapels, morgues, and charnel houses within its walls. The remains of tens of thousands of souls mixed into the mortar ensure Geb's dominion over the pyramid. While it is known as the Ghost King's Cage, it holds a wealth of necromantic knowledge, artifacts, tombs, treasures, and weapons that the Ghost King has kept dusty, knowing he has no need for crutches against any challengers. The Cinerarium is too large for one person, even for someone with the Ghost King's will, so it is also used by the Bellator Mortis, who use the lower levels as their barracks and armory. Above them, ancient liches, zombies, and ghouls maintain the city's records and administration, some of them continuing their work as ghosts. Geb's quarters are at the top of the pyramid, permanently sealed off since Arasni's escape. Geb communicates wherever he wants throughout the pyramid, and when melancholy strikes, he visits the drowned mummies of kings and wizards in the ancient Osirianic catacombs beneath the pyramid. These mummies serve as guards to keep intruders from tunneling through the flooded chambers and natural caves below. The Ebon Mausoleum, a sprawling campus dedicated to the study of necromancy, wields immense power with every proclamation, congress, and edict it issues. The entire structure is built from enchanted glass that neutralizes the effects of sunlight and fortified with thousands of metal rods and stone pillars. The main campus, which sprawls behind the glass structure, is comprised of long, single-story stone halls that are connected through a network of catacombs where both masters and students reside, study, and conduct their experiments. The main glass building hums with petitioners, inquirers, and customers who have come to purchase or coerce knowledge, or to commission the masters to apply necromancy in various ways. The mausoleum has a long history of being responsible for both marvelous and terrifying innovations in death magic. The great bloodlord Chancellor Kemnebi and Vikroti Stro, a lich necromancer, are now leading the college, and they seek to dismiss the idea that necromancy is merely a way to reanimate the dead. Kemnebi and Stro are pushing their most talented instructors and students to elevate necromancy to new heights, and Stro, in particular, wants to establish necromancy as its own distinct tradition of magic. The campus is filled with excitement as young, living necromancers engage in debates with ancient liches, ghosts, and vampires over the very nature of their study. The Cathedral of Epiphenomena stands as the largest temple devoted to the worship of Urgothoa across Galarian. Its black stone ziggurat serves as a central structure, towering up to a hundred feet high, with a set of wide stairs climbing up five steps on its eastern face. Below the stairs is a spacious area for public rituals that has been cleared where once a pyramid stood. A towering statue of Urgothoa, the goddess of disease and undeath, stands before the cathedral, and the blood of sacrifices keeps its feet wet. Priests perform devotions and prayers for small crowds that gather to witness the bloodletting. A single note tune plays through the tusk of an ancient colossal beast as the sacrifice is hung upside down above a cistern that slowly drains its blood. Renella Brennan, the high cleric of Urgothoa in Mechatar, is a powerful and revered figure, commanding a cult of fanatics who follow her every word as if it were divine. Her right arm has been petrified into a scythe-like claw, and she appears both beautiful and horrifying, draped in delicate black lace and blood-soaked skeletal remains. When she delivers her infrequent personal sermons, thousands of devotees flock to hear her speak and catch a glimpse of the blood that never stops flowing from her left hand. The blood lords of Mechatar give her the respect and attention she deserves, knowing that the favor of a cult of thousands is valuable. Disrespecting or disobeying the pallid princess is extremely dangerous, and there is little flexibility in how the church deals with such behavior. Though positive energy is a capital offense under the dead laws, offenders are rarely dealt with by the Bellator Mortis. Those who worship Phrasma are particularly despised, and suspected Phrasmans are often brutally murdered or sacrificed before the guards can intervene. The Grand Cirque Bazaar lies between the Ebon Mausoleum and the Cathedral of Epiphenomena, and has been a bustling marketplace for centuries. Despite changing ownership many times, the original structures still serve their intended purpose. The surface level resembles any other market in a bustling city, selling everything from antiques to weapons and trade goods. However, the true grandeur of the bazaar lies beneath the surface. Hawkers entice customers to enter dark chambers, lit by eerie ghost-fire lanterns and filled with the scent of incense. 
Skeletal hands emerge from gold-trimmed sleeves to offer strange and rare objects, while other shops showcase Garundi artifacts and rare Aslanti tablets. The wares range from ancient stones with powerful rites to stomach-churning spell components and dangerous magic. While such items are typically considered too profane and dangerous in other parts of the world, they can be found more easily and openly in Mechitar. Vassal Alley is a dangerous and diseased warren of crime, filled with cannibal cults, cursed individuals, and criminals. The district is haunted by wraiths that roam the shadows, feeding capriciously and following an unknown schedule. Unlike other areas of Mechitar, Vassal Alley has no architectural oversight, and the buildings have grown haphazardly consuming each other. The streets are dimly lit due to the leaning walls, slanted roofs, wooden slabs, and large canopies of cloth and leather between roofs. Most business conducted in Vassal Alley is too dangerous and offensive even for the citizens of Mechitar, making it a treacherous destination for visitors, especially at night. Despite its dangers, Vassal Alley is an ideal place to hide, if one can defend against its threats. Even the Bellator Mortis avoids this district, unless explicitly commanded otherwise by a prominent bloodlord. During twilight hours, the Deathless Arena attracts large crowds to witness flesh-crafting necromancers flaunting their latest works. These massive, monstrous creations are paraded through the city streets to incite support and gather wagers. Although some necromantic masters disdain the idea of their art being used for entertainment and gambling, they still engage in the games through intermediaries. These masters invest their wealth into some teams and contribute to the construction of the behemoths battling for titles and trophies, even as they denounce them publicly. The wealthiest teams showcase their control over their monstrous creations by leading them on leashes or riding them into the arena, which sometimes result in unexpected violence that amuses the audience. More experienced teams rely on mindless undead and hired guards to restrain their rabid creations and transport them in chains. In the north end of the city, Perdinatia was once the grand mansion of the Osirianic governor of the region. When the ghost king seized control of the city and slaughtered its occupants, the structure was left in ruins. Since then, a strange mist with hallucinogenic and permanently maddening properties permeates the area, affecting even the undead. Kemet Kenra, the Osirian governor slain by the ghost king, is said to be tethered to the mansion as a ghost as well, along with some of his compatriots. Although the ghosts are bound to the ruin, they could prove problematic for the blood lords if they gained access to living agents or unbound undead they could control, as Kemet has no loyalty to the ghost king. Thanathotmos is an unusual ruin from the early years of the Age of Serpents, resembling a coiled serpent without a head, and measuring nearly a hundred feet in width and two hundred feet in height. Powerful tomb guardians still protect the site after millennia, and therefore both the quick and the dead of Mechitar have largely left the ancient site unexplored. Iled Although not its capital, Iled is the largest city in Geb, and is often described as a grim and foreboding place, but the reality is even harsher. It is a sprawling metropolis that is home to the largest concentration of undead creatures in Galarian, ruled over by Bloodlord Hakajet, who has managed to repel countless military attacks while launching its own sorties. The city is surrounded by the notorious Bone Wall that no enemy has been able to breach. The streets behind the Bone Wall twist into a labyrinth filled with dead ends and blind turns but at the heart of the city stands the Panopticon, a tower designed by Hakajet that serves as an all-seeing eye. Iled is renowned for its four academies devoted to the dark art of necromancy. The Mortuarium, the most prominent and largest of the four, focuses on studying the boundary between life and death and is home to the occult organization known as the Twilight Sages. The Synostasis, on the other hand, concentrates on the study of bones, making it the most pragmatic of the four schools. The Shadow Academy delves into planar theory, exploring the links between the Boneyard, the Shadow Plane, and the Negative Energy Plane. Lastly, the Twilight Castrum, a more generalist school and one of the older academies. While currently not as highly esteemed as it once was, it still churns out a significant number of necromantic scholars. Iled is a massive city with a population of over 100,000, and it appears to be consumed by war and death. Roughly a third of its inhabitants are mindless undead creatures, and the rest are mostly involved in the business of war. From the Academy of Arms, which sees a constant stream of new recruits, to the various colleges that attract necromancers from around the world, death is omnipresent in the city's hierarchy. 
The undead hold positions of authority, while the hungry and mindless are kept in pens as starved weapons. Iled is a joyless and humorless city, where its inhabitants are focused on achieving power and machine-like perfection, even if it means turning on each other. The city is filled with smog, and its industry is run by mindless undead creatures that perform automated tasks. Iled is a city that favors the dead over the living, surpassing any other city in Geb in this regard. Here the quick know that they are second-class citizens, with every visitor and citizen in some way linked to one of the city's dead factions, institutions, or citizens. Trust is not extended to the quick, who cannot display loyalty to the city without undergoing undeath themselves. However, every year, living people come to Iled to study necromancy, experience a unique nightlife, learn the techniques of war from immortal war masters, and master the arts of weapon forging. Anyone wishing to settle in Iled or stay for more than two nights must be sponsored by a dead citizen in good standing or be bound to a dead institution, typically through formal employment. This bond is made tangible through minor necromantic brands, serving as tokens of the agreement. Contract documents and jewellery are typical tokens, but more apparent signs of bondage can also be seen. The quick here are under the control of their contract holders, obligated to behave correctly lest they find themselves without protection. The contract holders are responsible for any crimes committed by their wards, but such cases seldom reach the court as the dead efficiently eliminate offenders to safeguard their own reputation. The city of Alkenstar occasionally worries about Iled's manufacturing capabilities, although it has had little cause for concern due to Iled's intense focus on its own security and armaments. The city has little interest in exporting its products as it struggles to produce enough to keep its enormous armies supplied. Even millennia after the end of active hostilities, the city still prepares for the day when Nexus factories start producing monstrosities once more. With no space for diplomacy or foreign agencies, and a sponsorship strategy that discourages most foreign powers from sending officials to conduct business in the city, Iled is perhaps one of the most distrustful and distant cities in political terms. Its rigidly uncompromising stance against any form of diplomacy makes it a challenging place to embrace, and the citizens of Iled have no qualms about this. They make no effort to disguise their intention. The city was built for war, and it awaits the day when Geb calls upon them to fight once more. Relations with others will only complicate this mission. Bloodlord Hecajet is the necrolord of the Iron Crown, and is resolute in his duty to protect Geb through his leadership of Iled. He has held this position for thousands of years, maintaining control over his mental faculties through sheer willpower. Despite being one of the more powerful bloodlords, he has no patience for political games or those who seek his attention. However, as time has passed, Hecajet has noticed his memory fading away. He has devised a strategy to sacrifice useless memories to retain vital ones, focusing on important moments of battle and strategy. In doing this, he hopes to fulfill the vow he made to protect Geb at all costs, even at his own expense. Among Hecajet's most trusted advisors is General Nirkus, a fire giant who rose as a dreaded revenant and destroyed the group that killed him. Due to his adherence to military discipline and raw power, he quickly rose through the ranks and was tasked by the Iron Crown to lead a battalion of undead trolls and similar undead giants. Nirkas's flaming mane, typical of fire giants, vanished when he died, and he now hides his shame under a horned helmet, paying tribute to his god Zersvater. Though loyal and dedicated, he still craves the companionship of his fellow giants above all else, and he throws himself into battle, hoping to end his undead existence and return to his rightful place in hell. Another important figure in the city is Vela Roslin, a former Chelish noblewoman who spent decades arranging marriages among the Chelish elite and became an expert in navigating feuds, loyalties, and bloodlines, and ultimately found her calling in Iled as a vampire, arranging matches between the living and the dead for the purposes of building sponsorships. Through temporary marriages, adoption proceedings, university enrollments, and employment contracts, she produces tokens of sponsorship that offer legal protection to those in need. If safety is a concern in Iled, Vela can provide the necessary paperwork. The Panopticon, a towering structure in the heart of Iled, is a sight to behold. Its bone and metal exterior gives it a menacing appearance, with sharp spikes protruding from its surface and rusted iron flakes falling off to reveal newly grown metal. It is a masterpiece of engineering, providing the city with an all-encompassing view and the ability to use psychometry to locate anyone within the bone wall, regardless of whether they are alive or dead. 
The Iron Crown holds meetings within the Panopticon, while the Oversight Committee of the Unseen occupies multiple floors to keep detailed records on individuals of interest. Bloodlord Hecajet resides at the very top, surrounded by weapons and wards, as he sacrifices his memories and sanity to remain the leader of the city. Directly below the Panopticon, like the roots of an ancient tree, the Agaron is a colossal structure located beneath the city, with iron foundations stretching deep into the dried aquifer. It is adorned with precious metal plates, bone lacing, and effigies carved from the shadow plane matter. The massive hollow pyramid was built as a home for extraplanar entities, creating a liminal space between the negative energy plane, the plane of shadow, and the material plane. Only powerful and knowledgeable necromancers can enter the Agaron without being consumed by the overwhelming negative energy within. The Agaron is a source of great power that the masters of Eled draw upon to fuel the Bone Wall's magic, particularly in times of crisis. The Agaron is overseen by a cabal of enigmatic tomb giants and a triumvirate of Darvakas led by a mysterious creature known as the Bound One that also resides within its walls. Ilead's primary temple to Ergothoa is the Pallid Pinnacle, a bone-white spire. While it may be less grand than the Panopticon, and less influential than Mechitar's Cathedral of the Epiphenomena, the temple remains significant as the largest place of worship in Ilead. Pesnabet Zoheri is the high priest of the Pallid Pinnacle, and he is also secretly a prominent member of the Whispering Way cult, a group that owes its allegiance to the Whispering Tyrant and not the Ghost King. He is cunning enough to show loyalty to the Iron Crown, though, but he takes pride in keeping his temple and followers away from the city's political intrigues. In addition to his religious duties, he manages a smuggling operation, which thrives due to his knowledge of the city's underground trade routes. Pesnabet is always searching for new ways to enhance his undead body and his mastery of the dark arts. Grey Dirge Greydurge is a massive city made entirely of the bones of deceased Gebites who chose not to be reanimated after death, serving as either a warning or a memorial to those who chose to defy the dead laws. The city is governed by Tafgekta Seven Stomachs, a ghast aristocrat, but the true power lies with Berlin Haldoli, a halfling necromancer and bloodlord with close connections to the reanimator's faction. Berlin oversees the bountiful farms and ranches surrounding Greydurge, and the city boasts an imposing temple to Zonkuthon, the empty threshold which protects living congregants from the undead population. The towers of cleansing are scattered throughout the nearby foothills, where the recently deceased are left to nourish scavengers and dry out in the sun, allowing their bones to be collected for the upkeep of the city. Though these rituals defy the custom of reanimating the dead in Geb, the government tolerates them as a way to provide nourishment for the undead scavengers. Grey Dirge's architecture is similar to Ilead's bone wall, providing a fortified outpost for the dead in case of future conflicts. Corpse Light Corpse Light, located just north of the Axon Wood, doesn't cultivate crops, but instead keeps cattle and intelligent humanoids to feed Geb's undead population. In the past, these creatures were confined to pens, but now they are kept in mental cages due to demands for free-range meals. The use of hallucinogenic fungi and herbs, along with comfortable amenities in the pastures, have kept the current population subdued and distracted. This has even attracted other living beings seeking to escape the harsh reality of Geb, and its sentient farm herd has grown to 4,000 humanoids. Loyal undead patrons claim that not only have their meals improved in quality, but they can taste the vivid memories of these humans. Axon Wood Axon Wood, located in central Geb, just north of the Axonir River, is a grim reminder of the magical war that once raged between Nex and Geb. The forest is a desolate sight, with many of its trees dead or twisted into eerie shapes, resembling people who perished in some great calamity. Once home to dryads, the destructions of their trees turned them into ghostly specters who wander aimlessly, pleading for help in finding their lost oaks. The wood is also home to predators such as wolves who stalk the area in search of prey, living or dead. Malevolent fey delight in tormenting those who wander into their midst, and rumors persist of rare twilight unicorns residing within the wood, but encountering them is said to be a perilous venture. Sallow Shore Sallow Shore is a coastal community located north of Mechitar, slowly being swallowed by the ocean. Originally established as an Eruxi trading post, it has since been settled by both humans and Eruxi, and their descendants, both quick and dead, still reside in the town. 
The submerged part of Sallowshore is predominantly inhabited by Aruxi and aquatic ghouls who live in partially submerged structures, while the dry portion of the town is governed by a reclusive vampire aristocrat named Tobias Highridge, who has for decades been mourning the loss of his beloved wife. Rola's Fish Market, a damp marketplace situated on the border between the two halves of the town, is the cultural center of Salashore and a popular stop for coastal ships. The Gebite Darklands. Gebite influence doesn't just extend across the surface of the land, but often deep underground. Extensive travel networks extend across the Darklands, below the very country of neighboring necks, and reach as far north as Thuvia. Nemret Noctoria, the underground city of the ghouls, serves as the central hub of ghoul civilization in the inner sea area. Though it's a fair distance from Geb, lying beneath the borders of Osirian and Thuvia, the two nations send emissaries and trade delegates to one another. To foster good relations, Geb's bloodlords send an annual gift of their best stock to the city's priest king, Kortash Cain. Ghoul tunnels aren't the only thing crisscrossing the darklands beneath Geb. A community of underground dwarves known as the Kulinets reside beneath the mountainous terrain of Geb. They are known for their intricate tunnels and highways, which are called the Lara, which extend across the country and beyond the western side of the Shattered Range. This geographical advantage makes them valuable as fast and covert couriers or smugglers, depending on the client's needs. The Kulinet dwarves have a distinct physical appearance that sets them apart from other dwarf ethnicities. They are generally shorter in stature, which allows them to navigate the tight confines of their tunnels with ease. Their skin tones are deep and tawny, complemented by reddish-orange eyes and sable hair that is thick and grows straight. The Kulinets keep their hair short and practical, and they use simple metal clasps to adorn it. To outsiders, these clasps are seen as social status markers, but they are actually discrete communication devices. The clasps are painted with various colors, symbols, and runes that are visible under fluorescent fungi, creating living maps of the Lara's many secret paths and hazards. Kulinet hairstyling, such as the number of plates, is also used to convey covert information when traveling in mixed company. Some of the younger dwarves who have traveled to the Mwangi Expanse have even picked up hair dyeing techniques from the Taralu, experimenting with applications that glow under certain conditions. Kulinet dwarves favor a wardrobe that is both practical and stylish. Their attire includes light armor and traveler's garments, which are essential for traversing above ground while protecting against sand and bright light. Their vestments comprise two layers of robes that fall below the knees, accompanied by baggy drawstring pants that offer added protection from the elements. Kulinets are organized into a dozen settlements scattered throughout Geb, with each clan claiming a natural oasis or spring as their home. One noteworthy settlement is Ferdaz, located beneath a mountain and boasting a spring with supposedly powerful regenerative properties. However, due to Geb's dead laws prohibiting the use of positive energy, the location and existence of Ferdaz is a closely guarded secret. Those who wish to visit or gain access to the healing waters must perform a significant act of service to the city. The Kulinet settlements in Geb are each governed by a council of elders, respected and wise dwarves who provide guidance to their community. These elders are typically skilled craftsmen, spiritual leaders, and experienced trackers. Some clans have implemented safeguards to protect their veteran trackers who venture above ground, such as magical dead man switches that incinerates the individual and leaves nothing behind. To address the risk of their secrets being revealed by necromancers, some Kulinet clans have taken a different approach by allowing certain members of their groups to train in necromancy. While they strongly oppose necromancy in most forms, they maintain relations with Geb due to necessity. To provide further protections for their communities, Kulinet necromancers are denounced as traitors by their clans in public. Nonetheless, these brave dwarves now serve as the eyes and ears of the Kulinet community, gathering valuable intelligence on the undead and safeguarding the bodily autonomy of their recently deceased. In smaller settlements like Corpse Light and Grey Dirge, one can typically find at least one dwarf serving in this role. Moreover, in major cities like Mechitar and Eled, there is a thriving network of dwarven mages, including alumni from prestigious necromancy colleges such as the Mortuarium and the Ebon Mausoleum. The Kulinet people hold a strong belief in the importance of the earth and water, as well as traditional dwarven beliefs. They worship Torag along with Grundinar and Fulgrit, as well as local river and mountain deities. When depicting their gods, the Kulinets do so with their own sensibilities in mind, often depicting them wearing Kulinet robes and adorned with their clasps. 
Despite their insular society, the Kulinets are known for their hospitality towards any stranger in need of help or refuge. They have temporary dwellings near the surface, usually in caves and caverns, which serve as their public areas and relief camps. These locations are situated at a distance from their settlements to keep them hidden, but close enough to be accessible within a day's travel through special tunnels. Kulinets have a complex relationship with their distant kin, the dwarves of the Dongan Hold. Despite their close ties, the older Kulinets harbor resentment towards Dongenhold for choosing to cut themselves off from magic and the gods by delving deep into the Darklands. This feeling is exacerbated by the fact that traditional Kulinets find Dongenhold's development of technology without regard for their surroundings to be alarming. Whenever skirmishes occur between Alkenstar and Geb, the rift between the two groups tends to widen. Gebites often blame all dwarves for the conflicts and retaliate by raiding nearby Kulinet camps. This has led some Kulinets to hold Dongan Hold responsible for the damage brought down on them, even if it wasn't intentional. Mm -hmm.